glad to be here today to share the word of God with us. Um, I must say, Pastor David has been on leave, so don't wonder where our senior pastor is. Eh? He's resting, uh, but he is well. Actually, we were with him yesterday here for the DNA meeting, and uh, it is good as also servants of God to take time and rest and just to be refreshed uh, even as we continue to labor in the Lord. Praise the Lord. Um, we are still on, on our series on the book of Thessalonians. Today we get to go into 2 Thessalonians. Um, we were going through 1 Thessalonians, the first you know, five chapters of this letter. And I know last week we spoke about the day of the Lord, and maybe there are people who thought, why didn't we finish up to the end? Uh, but basically, the last portion of scripture uh, in First Thessalonians chapter 5, I was telling the second service then that it is more of, now Paul kind of puts into bullets, you know, things that he wants the church to be, uh, and even to seek to follow as you come to the end of First at Thessalonians chapter 5, you know, verse 12 to 9, and he just points out a few things, not even explaining much about them. Things like, do not, you know, uh, stifle the Holy Spirit, uh, always be joyful, pray without ceasing, um, you know, that, that you see that no one pays back evil for evil, that is verse number 15. Going up, he says, continue to encourage those who are timid that indeed they may become active, um, Show great respect and wholehearted love because, you know, to the servants of God. And he says in verse number 12 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, that honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. So at the end of the first letter, this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul just points out a few things that he'd want the church to continue to do in honoring their leaders, in being of encouragement to one another, in getting to be a people of prayer, to be a people who are joyful, a people who are grateful even in all circumstances. And so that is where, that is where we find, basically, the ending of First Thessalonians. And so today we go into Second Thessalonians. Um, uh, and, 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 and coming into this, I said last Sunday that Second Thessalonians, uh, scholars say that this was written like six months later, Six months later, after sending this first letter of First Thessalonians, scholars say that this second letter was not sent actually immediately. They say like it took, after around six months, that is when Paul got to send this second letter. And the purpose of this was probably, it is said he had received, he, he had received a report from the city, you know, detailing some questions that people were asking, some problems that had actually arisen in the church regarding end times. Because Second Thessalonians, the content of it, the majority of the content therein is all about the end times. It's all about the end times. And I just want us to pick out a few things first, even as we go into this book. And these are things that you need to note carefully uh, as we talk about Second Thessalonians. Some are in light of the similarity with First Thessalonians because one of the things you find in 2 Thessalonians is the first thing you see there is the greeting, you know, that Paul again comes back with as we saw in 1 Thessalonians. Because in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we see that he says that this is a letter from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. The similar way that he wrote even when he was writing the first letter. And so you can see a similarity in these two greetings even as he's writing this second letter. We are writing to the church in Thessalonica. To you who belong to God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. May God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, give you grace and peace. And when you look at this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, it is far much and more, more similar to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 1. So the greeting is similar. But then, why Paul again writes 2 Thessalonians? It is important of us to note this from the onset. There are some people who are actually sending false letters to the church. There was like gutter press <laughs> then. <laughs> and their message was actually that the day of the Lord has already come. So they who are sending these letters 
And they who were subscribing and telling people to subscribe to this teaching, they were telling them, actually, the day of the Lord has come. And so Paul, in writing 2 Thessalonians, he's addressing this matter. He's addressing this matter. And that is why when you read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, just to give us a bit of overview in there, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 2, he says, Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. So he's telling them, I know there are people who are sending you letters. They're sending you spam mail. <laughs> you know, they're sending, sending you messages and saying, actually, the day of the Lord has come. So it is important of us to have that picture even as we go into this study during this uh, coming Sundays regarding 2 Thessalonians. And so he's telling them, be careful. I am aware that there are some people who are already even sending you letters sending you this kind of teaching and telling you that the day of the Lord has come. It is important of us to have this even as we get into this book. But then the third thing that Paul uses, and he says that you need to know that there is a way I write my letters. Paul had a distinguished way of doing his letters. And, and this really encouraged me to understand why sometimes he says at the end of his letters that this is why I write with my own handwriting. Are we together? And I was asking myself if, you know, sometimes we joke here in the office and say some of us, our handwritings, we should have been doctors. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Just because of how we write. And so Paul is telling them, you need to know that my letters have a distinguishing mark on them. You're able to know the, the authenticity of my letters and you're able to know them that they come from me. And that is why in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Verse number 14 to 17, he says, Take special note of anyone who does not obey our instruction in this letter. Do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed. Yet, do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. And then in verse number 17, he says that, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters that this is how I write. And so he's telling them, brethren, I know there are guys who have been telling you things. They have been sending you letters. But for you to verify that the letters have come from me, he says that I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters, that this is how I write. And actually, when you look at most of his letters, even when you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse number 21, you'd see there it says that I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 11, he says, See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Colossians 4, 18, he says that I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains, grace be with you. And so Paul knew that he needed to have a distinguishing mark regarding his letters. Because therein, in that time, what used to happen is that Paul, what he would do, he would kind of, uh, what do you call it, dictate the writings of his letters. So as Paul would do, he'd call somebody like his secretary, and this person would be tasked to write what Paul was, was dictating. And so that is why when you look at most of his letters, you see at the Beginning, there is a greeting, but when you come to the end, there's normally that topic, Paul's final greetings. That was always the signature of Paul. And so Paul is telling them, for you to know that this is from me, this is how I write. This is how I do it. You know, because actually when you read like in Romans chapter 16, verse number 22, just to show you the place of dictation, you see that in Romans chapter 16, verse number 22, there's one called Tatias. And he says that I, Tatias, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the name of the Lord. And that is in the book of Romans, because Tatias was like a secretary, was like a secretary to Paul in writing all this. And that is why when Paul says that I myself write with my own handwriting, was just to show them that these letters were from me. 
And so what he was telling this church, because I've seen gutter press are saying this, <laughs> because I've seen you guys are receiving false letters, you're able to know that this letter is from me because of my own handwriting and because of this greeting that I am speaking to you. But then the fourth thing I want us to note, even as we come to 2 Thessalonians, and I have said this, the 2 Thessalonians actually talks more about the message of the end times because these people were a bit confused. He had left them from a place where he had introduced the issue of the day of the Lord. And so in writing this second letter, this letter basically distinguishes itself from the first one because it presents the message about the end times. And so I want us to have this even as we come into this second book of Second Thessalonians so that we can have an understanding of it. But then the big picture in terms of the outline, in terms of this book, three things are covered in this book. First, Paul encourages the persecuted believers, and that is what we are going to be talking about today, our faith in times of persecution. So this book is divided into three in terms of its outline. The second thing that we'll find that Paul addresses was to correct a misunderstanding concerning the Lord's return. And this you find it in 2 Thessalonians from chapter 2, uh, verse number 12, you know, verse number 1 to number 12. That is what Paul talks about, the misunderstanding, the man of lawlessness, as you'll see next Sunday. But then the last thing he does is to encourage the Thessalonians to be steadfast and to work for a living. And this we find it from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 13 to the end, that is chapter 3 number, up to verse number 15. So I just want us to have this picture even as we come now to this uh, Second Thessalonians, just an, as an introduction of what Second uh, Thessalonians is all about. So today we go into Second Thessalonians chapter 1, and I read from verse number 1 to 12, and it says, the first place is the greeting, which I've already spoken about, so allow me to start from verse number 3. And it says this, Dear brothers and sisters, we can't help but thank God for you because your faith is flourishing and your love for one another is growing. We proudly tell you God's, uh, you know, we proudly tell God's other churches about your endurance and faithfulness in all the persecutions and hardships you are suffering. And God will use this persecution to show his justice and to make you worthy of his kingdom for which you are suffering, in his justice, he will pay back those who persecute you. And God, verse number seven, will provide rest for you who are being persecuted. And also for us, when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven, he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who do not know God and on those who who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. Verse number 10, that when he comes on that day, he will receive glory from his holy people, praise from all who believe, and this includes you, for, what, for you believed what we told you about him. So we keep on praying for you, asking our God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call. May he give you the power to accomplish all the good things your faith prompts you to do. Then the name of our Lord Jesus will be honored because of the way you live and you will be honored along with him. This is all made possible because of the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. And so in this first part of 2 Thessalonians, this first chapter 1, Paul takes time to encourage them to share on matters of persecution. And today, as our, Simon, as our sermon title would be, how is our faith or how should our faith be in times of persecution? Maybe to you who's listening to me, you may be saying faith in times of suffering. Faith in times of oppression. And Paul takes time just to talk about this issue of persecution, but more to it to encourage the church. To encourage the church. Because we need to ask ourselves, so what kind of persecution were these people experiencing? 
We are told, and maybe may not be so much written there, but in most places, just by their confession, just by being believers, some of them, their property was seized. Some of them, as workers, they were stopped from practicing even their trades. Because of this, some were even shunned by their families. Some were insulted. Some were beaten. Some were even put to death. You know, if you've ever read about persecution, you hear about one leader who was called Nero. We are told that at night he would actually burn up people to be like the lights. You know, there you have street lights. He would light up people and burn them, and those would be their street lights then. That was the form of persecution that these people were experiencing. I was looking even at statistics, and actually it is said that Kenya ranks number 49 in light of persecution in the world, persecution for the gospel. And that is where Kenya lies. And so Paul is writing to this church, knowing that this is what they are going through. And you know, their persecution, you may ask, who was persecuting them? First Thessalonians, which we studied a few weeks ago, chapter 2, says this in verse number 14. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 14. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people. The same things those churches suffered from the Jews. And so Paul was basically understanding that the persecution that these people were going through, other versions would say that you suffered persecution from your fellow countrymen. So it was not external, it was just around them. It was their friends, it was the people, their fellow countrymen, the people around them were the ones who were persecuting them. And when we read in the book of Acts, you see various forms of persecution that get to happen to the leaders, to the church, to the apostles. And persecution was present then. And so we need to ask ourselves, how shall our faith be in times of persecution? Second Corinthians chapter 4 would say, verse number 8, that we are, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. And this is where this church was at. This is where this church was, this is what this church was experiencing. John 16, verse number 33 would say that in this world you will face many troubles. Matthew 10, 22 would say that you will be hated by everyone because of me. Matthew 24, verse 9 would say you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Praise the Lord. And that is where this church of Thessalonica found itself. This is where they were. They were facing persecution. They were facing persecution. And so when you come back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 3 and 4, Paul he says again, and I repeat, that dear brothers and sisters, we can't help but thank God for you because of your faith is flourishing, your love for one another is growing, we proudly tell God's other churches about your endurance and faithfulness in all the persecutions and hardships you are suffering. That Paul begins in encouraging this church by what I would say, his way of writing, by commending them, but also he's commending them from a place of thanksgiving. Praise the Lord. The three things he's grateful about this church is number one, is that their faith is flourishing. Praise the Lord. That their faith is flourishing. That their faith in times of persecution is flourishing. That it is growing. The second thing he's grateful about them is that their love for one another is growing. Remember in 1 Thessalonians, he was talking to them and telling them, let brotherly love grow. Let it grow. Let that love be evident. And so he's grateful to them because 
their love for one another is growing. But thirdly, Paul is grateful for this about their endurance and faithfulness in times of persecution. Praise the Lord. Endurance and faithfulness in times of persecution. Somebody says about this that our keys of surviving persecution is endurance and faithfulness. Is endurance and faithfulness. And that is why Paul says that we proudly tell God's other churches about your endurance and faithfulness in all the persecutions and hardships that you are suffering. And Paul was grateful because of these three things. Their faith, their love, their endurance, and their faithfulness in times of persecution. You know, persecution is not a good thing to talk about in a church because many wonder, how shall it come? No one wants to be at the center of persecution. No one wants to be present when persecution is happening. But you know, in times of persecution, our faith is put to the test. Our faith is put to the test. The faith of the Thessalonians was put to the test in their time of persecution. But do you know, as hard as it may be to say this, persecution sometimes is a good thing. It is a hard one to accept. But when you look at the early church, when you read in the various accounts of persecution in the book of Acts, we see the time when the church grew was in times of persecution. The church experienced supernatural growth in their times of persecution. I was reading someone who has wrote a thesis, a master's thesis on persecution. And there's something they say which struck me. And they say that persecution is an acid test and a catalyst for spiritual growth. Persecution is an acid test. You know acid will burn you. Are together? But persecution being a catalyst, a catalyst is one that kind of increases the rate of a chemical reaction. So when you say persecution is like a catalyst, in the early church when persecution came, it was a catalyst for the increase and the growth of the church. And I say again, persecution is an acid test, but yet it is also a catalyst for spiritual growth. Your sufferings, the oppressions you may be going through may be an acid test to you. But many times, the way you handle that, it becomes a catalyst for you for spiritual growth. Have you ever found that you, you get to grow when you're going through suffering? <laughs> Praise the Lord. You get to remember God more <laughs> when you're going through oppression. That oppression becomes a catalyst for you for your spiritual growth. For your spiritual growth. And Paul was basically seeing this picture. That this was an acid test to this church. But yet it was also a catalyst for their spiritual growth. You know, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 8, maybe just going back a bit. It says, for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place, the news of your faith toward God has gone out. The news of your faith has gone out. That this church was known. This church was known about their faith in times of persecution. I don't know for K3C, what are we known for? What are we known for? As we continue on in talking about faith in times of persecution, Paul has talked about their faith, has talked about their love, their endurance, and their faithfulness. And this persecution becoming an acid test to them, becoming a catalyst for their growth. 
But then when you continue in verse number four, again, just in the sense of it, you find that our testimony in times of persecution matters. Praise the Lord. Our testimony in times of suffering, our testimony in times of when our bosses are oppressing us, our testimonies when people want us to compromise and use shortcuts matters. Our testimony is put to the test. That are we able to still have faith in those times of trial? Are we still able to endure, as you see in the same verse number four? Are we still able to be faithful that we may not shame the name of the Lord? Our testimony in times of persecution matters. Listening to a someone, somebody was saying that one day people were in a church and some people walked in and they say that those who believe in God remain and those who do not believe in God, you are free to go. And these people thought that these people had actually come to kill them. But that is the day the pastor knew the people who were faking their faith. Because when they remained, they who had come as enemies told the pastor, now let us praise the Lord, let us now sing to the Lord. We have known those who believe in the Lord. Praise the Lord. Because the people knew now today is our day, let me deny Jesus. But our testimony in times of persecution matters. And this was a testimony that Paul had and he was saying to them, we proudly tell the other churches. Are people able to tell your colleagues, to tell your friends, that your testimony still stands even in a time of oppression, in a time of persecution. Our testimony matters in times of persecution, brethren. But then, when you go to verse number five and six, Paul tells them this, and there are four things that Paul talks about regarding persecution. And he says this in verse number five, reading from the New Living Translation. And he says, and God will use this persecution. God will use this persecution, number one, to show his justice. Praise the Lord. Because God's justice is all about God's judgment. That God will judge they who persecute you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That even in the place you find yourself today in the office, in the place you find yourself in your family, God is telling you that through this, number one, his justice, his judgment shall be evident. His fighting for you shall be evident. And he says that he will use this, number one, to show his justice. And so as I tell you about this, I say today, maybe that is the place you find yourself. People have risen against you. But yet I pray that this word may encourage you even for you today. Because maybe you have stood for your faith. You have stood for your faith. That God is telling you that even in this number one, I will show my justice. I will judge they who oppress you. I will handle them for you. And so for you is to be at peace, to be still, to know that he's telling you even today. And this church was being told that God's judgment will come and that the Lord himself will show his justice. God will use this persecution, number one, to show his justice. But number two, he says this, to make you worthy of his kingdom. Whatever shall make us worthy of his kingdom beyond salvation, brethren, sometimes persecution will come in to make us worthy. Praise the Lord. To make us worthy of his kingdom. There is no greater example I can use more than the example of Stephen. Stephen, when you read in Acts chapter 7, verse number 54 to 60, we are told that the Jewish leaders were so angry with Stephen and they shook 
their fist at him in rage in verse number 54. But we are told, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, his faith was intact, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. You know, when us preachers, when we speak about this, we say that God actually stood. You know, the Bible says he's seated at the right hand of the Father. But you're told that God himself stood because of this one who was found worthy of the kingdom. Stephen was able to see a reality, a dimension in the spirit in his time of persecution. And that is why the Bible says that he gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God. Sometimes for us, brethren, for us, some of us to see the glory of God, we may need to go through persecution to go into this dimension. And persecution, as Paul is telling them, God will use this to make you worthy of his kingdom. And Stephen in himself was made worthy because of persecution. And actually we are told that after this persecution of Stephen, in Acts chapter 8, verse number 1, we are told that a great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all the believers except the apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria because of this persecution that had come upon Stephen. What am I saying? That persecution brings us to a place where we also become worthy in the kingdom of God. And Paul is telling them that, brethren, be encouraged. God will use this persecution to make you worthy of his kingdom. Praise the Lord. But then he continues to say that in his justice, he will pay back those who persecute you. That Paul is telling them that the Lord shall avenge for you. That the Lord shall fight for you in light of his justice. That is why Romans chapter 12 Verse number 19 says that do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, you know, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And sometimes, friends, even in our times of oppression, wherever we work, we need to allow God to fight for us. We need to say and claim this scripture, sorry, and understand it, that God says that God will use this persecution to show you that vengeance is his. That he alone can fight for you. But then, in verse number 7, again Paul says that God will use this persecution to do what? To give you rest. Praise the Lord. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse number seven, he says, and God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted. Praise the Lord. God will provide rest. God will provide rest. There are things God will do in our lives. There is a rest that God will give us in our times of persecution. And this is the faith that Paul is talking about in writing to this church. Faith in times of persecution. That God says that he will use this persecution to provide rest for you. Are there battles you've been facing? Are there battles you've been going through? Understand this, that even in such a time as this, the Lord says he's able to provide rest for you. Praise the Lord. He is able to provide rest for you. My time is far much gone. But I'd like just to end here and say this. That our faith in times of persecution, we said, is our acid test. Is our catalyst for our spiritual growth. But yet I want us to go out of this place today knowing that may we allow the Lord to fight for us. May we allow the Lord to showcase his justice. 
in our times of persecution, may we allow the Lord to make us worthy of his kingdom. In our times of persecution, may we allow the Lord to avenge for us. In our times of persecution, may we allow the Lord to bring us to a place of rest. To a place of rest. To a place of rest. John 15, verse number 18 to 21 would say, If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belonged to it. But you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally, they will also persecute you. Naturally, they will also persecute you. Second Timothy, I end with these verses. Chapter 3, verse number 12. Second Timothy, chapter 3, verse number 12, it says, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Will be persecuted. And so for us, our process of growing, our process of maturing, our process of becoming like Christ's brethren will involve persecution. Will involve persecution. And the Lord is telling us today, may our faith not wither. May our faith, as was in this church, go forth. May our testimony be that we are a people in our offices who endure, who still remain faithful even in times of persecution. Even in times of persecution. May we bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, even for your word today. Sometimes to have that faith in a time of affliction, Lord, is a difficult thing, O Abba, Father. But today, Lord, we come in the very same encouragement that Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica. The Lord, your word says that, and Paul wrote to them and told them that God will use this persecution to show his justice to make them worthy of the kingdom, to avenge for them, and to bring them to a place of rest. Father, I pray today, the church of Christ, even in this nation, in some regions of this nation, has gone through persecution. Lord, we seek to still hold on in the testimony that we firmly believe in our God and our Savior. At this moment, even as we come to the end of this sermon today, I just want to pray with you. Have you been going through what for you you'd call your persecution, your oppression, your suffering? I feel like I just need to pray with you. Just wherever you are, just stand up. Just because you stand for Christ in your office, Many have slandered you. Many have risen against you. But I pray that this word will come as an assurance to you today that God is using that to make you worthy. If you are there, I encourage you just to stand. And I'll pray with you. Thank you. Lord, we come in response to your word. The Bible says that the world will hate us because of our stand in you. Our colleagues will want us to do shortcuts, to do the wrong thing. But because of our faith, O oh God, Father, we seek to stand and not ashamed the name of the Lord. Father, I pray the Lord as you have spoken to us that our faith in times of persecution as a church our faith in times of oppression, of suffering, of affliction matters, O oh God. 
I pray for this beloved Lord who are standing. For Lord, they have chosen to stand for you. Lord, not to shame you, but to shame the devil. I pray that Jehovah God, in whatever they are going through, Abba Father, may you show justice on their behalf. Lord, may you make them worthy. May their testimony stand right, O God. May you avenge for them, O Abba Father. And even bring them to a place of rest where they are anxious, where they are troubled, where they are in pain. O God, Father, bring them to a place of rest. Bring them to a place of rest today. Whatever has been a burden to them, Lord, we are saying that it's being lifted up today. Whatever has been of pain to them, Father, we are speaking the rest of God. The peace of God that surpasses all human understanding. Father, I speak relief over their lives. I speak refreshing over their lives. Well, Lord, even they have cried out to you. Father, I speak a newness, a rest, a stillness that is from the Lord. Lord, we bless you and we honor you. As a church of this land, Lord, we know that, God, you're fighting for us. You're fighting for your church. That even when persecution may come around us, O oh God, the Lord, may we be reminded of this word today, that, Lord, may our faith still stand even in times of persecution. Lord, we bless you, we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. The Lord bless you.